Welcome back, AP. All right. Woo. You guys are absolutely killing the game right now. I have full confidence that y'all are probably some of the most studious, best, smartest, brightest, greatest bulbs in the box that I've ever met. And I think y'all are going to crush this AP test. But let's keep it rolling forward, shall we? When I witnessed Carson and Gross and whoever said the last part of the answer in class today, talking about like the expanse of Petrarch ver uh, Petrarch's ideas versus Erasmus's due to the impetus of printing in this era, I almost lost my mind. All right, so just so you understand, you guys are killing it. Uh, we did start talking about printing and the importance of printing in European history uh, when we got cut off by the bell today, right? So we started talking about how like the original idea for the printing press was not created by Gutenberg and it was actually an Asian design that had existed for several hundred years, particularly coming out of Korea and China, right? Now, unfortunately, they weren't as good as the uh, Western, or uh, they would not be as good as the Gutenberg press in quality due to the fact that, of course, Gutenbergs were made out of metal, right? And we talked about like the inability for the wooden types that the Asiatic communities had, were using to actually stay super dexterous over time and they would actually fall apart, right, and degrade. But the big stroke of genius was when, of course, Gutenberg himself showed up and was a metalsmith and he designed the very, very first type or movable type printing press that Europe had ever seen. Now, what do I mean by type? All right, let's talk about the word type for a hot second. So the word type has to do, excuse me, the word type has to do with the letters themselves, okay? So just so you understand that, hold on one second, I'm checking a date on something. Uh, there we go, yeah. So type means an individual metal piece that is actually has a letter imprinted on it on a raised up level, right? So I want you to imagine a stamp, right? Imagine you had a stamp that had a T on it, right? So, and to spell my name, you would need four other letters, right? You would need a T, an E, an R, an R, and a Y, right? And what you typically do whenever you're using a stamp is you dab the stamp into ink and then you press that on the paper. Now, the way that Gutenberg's press, which was invented in about circa 1440, uh, about 1439, give or take, some historians have actually attributed to it, attributed it attributed to a lot of historians think it was invented closer to like 1439. Uh, and the big difference is instead of like doing what we were just talking about, taking that rubber stamp and squishing it into ink and then smacking it on the paper, uh, Gutenberg, Gutenberg's design was a little bit different. Instead, you would take those, imagine taking that stamp though and then lining all of them up exactly the way you needed them, right? And they're not made out of rubber, they're made out of metal now, so the letters are raised up, right? Each of those raised up metal letters is known as a type, which again, we were talking about in class, is why it was known as a type writer, because it's literally taking a metal type and slamming it into an ink ribbon and then pressing it on the paper, right? So each of these types were made in metal, which made his design far superior when it comes to quality, uh, movement, uh, dexterity, uh, efficiency than many of the Asian models that came before it. But it is a little bit kind of Eurocentric and ridiculous to think that Gutenberg himself invented the very first printing press, right? And also you have to understand that yes, Gutenberg is sort of important, not really though, but like, again, uh, where did the paper come from, right? Well, paper making came from China and then expanded its easeability through Muslim Spain, right? So the Muslims were actually the very first people to realize an efficient way to make paper based on the Chinese ability to make paper out of wood pulp, and then also based off the Egyptian North African tradition of making paper out of a substance called papyrus, which is actually these reeds that lie at the riverbank. So the Muslims took over ancient Egypt as their uh, religion was growing. You might remember when we talked about today, the Crusades, like, you're not Christian, stab, stab, stab. Um, like, and then that all got out of sorts. Well, the Muslims had actually taken over, taken over the Holy Land and also most of North Africa and also Spain, southern Spain, leading into the European Renaissance period. So along the way, 
cultural diffusion is going to occur, right? When the Muslims end up taking over uh, Egypt, they end up adopting some of these papermaking skills that the ancient Egyptians used. And then, of course, with their trades with the Chinese, they're going to learn the Chinese way of actually making it. And making paper is a very simple way, but it's a genius way at the same time. Uh, you actually take whatever substance you want to use, right? Whatever substance you want to use, and you actually fray it apart until you create it into what was known as pulp, right? Now imagine, for example, pulp in orange juice, right? Pulp is, of course, that fine meat matter, that fine little shredded up matter that actually sits on top of your orange juice, which I don't know about y'all, but I am a huge fan of pulp in my orange juice. I think it is A number one. I like it with my straw that pushes through like a layer of pulp on top. It's absolutely delicious, right? So they would take this pulp, right, and then they lay it out right here, as you can see, onto a wire mesh like mold and then they press the water out of it, and then they would leave those sheets out to dry, effectively creating paper, right? Now, when you think of paper, you typically consider paper to be in a couple of different forms, right? You usually always imagine that it is made of wood, right? And it is something that you write on. But just so you understand, paper is the process of making a substance for writing on. Making a paper-based anything doesn't necessarily have to be mean, mean it's made out of wood. So some of y'all probably realized that I took this dollar out of my like wallet, right? This piddly $1 bill. I only have two because apparently I have no money. Um, so this, for example, is not made of paper in the sense that you think it is, right? A lot of y'all are like, oh, well, that's made out of, that's paper money. It's made out of wood and stuff. So funny enough, this is not made out of wood, but it is made in a paper making process, right? This is actually made out of cotton and linen bound together. That's why it doesn't like fall apart whenever it's going through the washing machine, right? It's actually much more durable, okay? However, cheap paper that is made out of wood or pulp from a fibrous wood-like material was actually perfected by the Muslims long before the Europeans ever even knew how to do that, pull it off, or how it was possible. So the big thing about it is the Europeans kind of hit the gold mine, culturally speaking, at just the right time. Gutenberg's printing press, of course, was an advent off of an Asian model. Uh, the Europeans would have had nothing to print on if it hadn't have been for the Muslim kingdoms that existed in North Africa, right? So, ironically enough, Gutenberg's not as important as people give him credit for. Now, however, though, with cheap, effective printing, literacy is going to explode, okay? Due to the fact that books were now made by monks, nuns, and printers, right? So the big thing about it is, what is that going to do to the cost of a book? It's going to tremendously take it down, right? A book made on a printing press is going to be much cheaper than a book made by a monk or a nun. Now, did monks and nuns continue to copy Latin versions of the Bible? Of course they did, right? Most of your printed books were actually done in vernacular languages, right? So does that mean Dante's Divine Comedy was printed? Of course it does, right? So does that mean a lot of these are, does the praise of folly, is that going to be printed? Oh, that's going to be printed and shot all over the place, right? And during this era of this Republic of Letters that was going on in, a, or going on in uh, Renaissance Europe, if anyone ever wrote a letter that had a specific idea inside of it that people believed could, should be proliferated or spread all over, that letter could easily be taken transcribed onto a printing press, printed, and then shot everywhere, right? Pamphlets were a very, very big thing when it comes to uh, the spread of ideas in, in, uh, in Renaissance Europe, right? So Gutenberg, not that important. Johannes Gutenberg, the man, not that important. His development of a metal-type printing press is very important. However, this would have come up again later at some point, right? But a lot of people give Gutenberg a lot more credit than he deserves. However, the coolest thing about it is between eight and 20 million books were printed within the first 50 years of the very first metal type printing press. So let's say circa 1440. So by 1510, by the time that Michelangelo finished painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling, 20 million books had been printed, right? And more than had ever been ever produced up to that point, ever. Like that's wild to think that in a 50 year time span, they produced far more books than Europe had ever produced over several hundred years. That's absolutely ridiculous, right? So the big thing is, is printing is a massively important idea. 
It's going to make the transmission of intelligence much quicker. It's going to make the transmission of information much quicker. And it's going to make the transmission of reporting, news, events, uh, historical documentation, all kinds of stuff, super important and much more efficient. But now we're going to be getting into talking about Renaissance art. That's right. You got to be careful. Your presentations are coming up soon. Make sure you're on your ball and ready for that, right? I don't need you to present for eight days. I just need you to present on like the super intricate little details of the art and kind of just to explain why your artwork is a great example of Renaissance artwork, right? But the big thing we need to talk about before we even get there is of course why all this artwork was made in the Renaissance in the first place and why most people in an average sense when they're looking at European historic, historic modalities, how they tend to view Renaissance as just an art wave, right? Where actually, of course, we know it's an economic and intellectual wave fueled mostly by the economics of the entire trend of the time period. Now, where does this all go back to? A ton of it goes back to this key word, patronage, right? Remember we talked about it in class today? It didn't go money, it went money, right? It's very, very different, right? Because patronage is support for an artist given by wealthy families and wealthy groups, right? So when I say families, our big patronage families that we're talking about here are, we're usually referring to, let me think, we're usually referring to the Medici, the Sforza <laughs> in the Holy Roman Empire. There's a family of patrons called the Fuggers, F-U-G-G-E-R-S, which I'm sorry, I have to say that word on a flip every single year. And there's a parent without a shadow of a doubt that just walked behind you and heard that word probably, and it's freaking out. But there is a family in the middle of Europe from the Holy Roman Empire that were a major patronage family, spelled F-U-G-G-E-R-S. And I apologize, I am not trying to freak people out, but that is their name. And apparently the Medicis and the Fuggers hated each other, all right? So, and the other big ones, of course, the Habsburgs, um, as well as uh, some of the other Viscontis, and also the Tudors could be considered some of the most famous and wealthy families that were patrons, but groups could also be patrons as well. A lot of the guilds in Florence were major patronage groups. For example, Kimberly Adams, right? Kimberly Adams has the dome that she's going to be talking about tomorrow. That was paid by the Wool Merchant Guild of Florence, right? So, and that was a major structure, right? So Florence is mainly the leader in artistic patronage, but Rome, Venice, and Northern Europe also do end up claiming their own stake. And we are going to get into the Northern Europe perspective a little bit more as the week goes on, right? But Rome, Venice, uh, Milan is also going to see some patronage. For example, one of the most famous pieces of Renaissance art is, uh, sorry, I'm still trying to laugh, I'm trying my best not to laugh about the fact that I have to say that, that family name almost every single year. Uh, so, big thing about it though, Rome, Venice, Northern Europe, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, getting into it, though, are going to end up having their own stake. Uh, Rome, of course, is going to be massive because it's the center of the Catholic Church. Milan has one of the most famous pieces uh, the Renaissance art world has ever seen uh, in The Last Supper, done by da Vinci. Uh, Venice actually is a very, very big home of this place called Mannerism, which uh, actually has to do with like, Caravaggio and late Renaissance uh, like art actually popping up. And this, of course, being a great example. That right there is the fresco on the inside of the dome that Kimberly is going to be talking about tomorrow, right? And then, of course, here's a terrible picture of me, and I'm not going to let you see my face because I don't know what it is about my face, but I can't take a picture to save my life. Like, what am I doing? I look ridiculous, all right? So anyway, but that right there, this, these are the golden baptismal doors, also known as the doors to heaven. Those were actually made by a guy named, excuse me, uh, Lorenzo Ghiberti, right? And they were actually cast on the baptismal font, which is directly across the street from the dome that Kimberly is going to be talking about soon, right? So, big thing is, though, all this stuff was paid for by Florence cloth merchants, right? So, these guilds did have a heavy hand in paying for a lot of commissioned art. It was not just these powerful families. Ugh. Oh, excuse me. But anyway, continuing forward, got to have a little water on hand. So towards the late 15th century, all right, so 15th century, of course, being the 1400s, right? Make sure you have your chronologies and your century numbers kind of like worked out in your head. 
So if you're 15th century, that's the 1400s, right? A lot of it is because the first century didn't have a thousand on it yet. So that's like the first century following the birth of Christ. So the big thing about it is towards the late back end of it, towards the late 14th century, or excuse me, late 15th century, individuals, wealthy individuals and families are going to begin to patron art and use their money in different ways, right? For example, uh, this is actually a very good quote, actually directly drawn from a very, very important person. I think it casts a brilliance on our estate, which is uh, as in public reputation, and it seems to me that this is money well spent. And this is a very famous individual talking about how they believe that paying for art casts a brilliance upon their family when it comes to being publicly recognized, right? And who actually said that? This guy. Who is that guy? That is Lorenzo Medici, also known as Il Magnifico, right? Lorenzo di Medici is the third son of the first Medici ruler of Florence, right? Cosimo, Cosimo the Elder, right? So Lorenzo happens to be the biggest Medici patron of art throughout most of like Florentine history, right? This actually is a very famous, not very famous work of art, actually. This battle scene is one of the very first sculpture pieces ever commissioned by a Medici. And who did it? Michelangelo, right? But Michelangelo made this, as you can tell, when he was a very young man. And he was actually living in the Medici home while he made it, right? So the Lorenzo Medici and the Medici family took art patronage a step further. They even allowed certain, like, art historians and artists to live inside their home and foster their technique while living there, right? Like, so Lorenzo Medici is a perfect example of a family-based patron, right? As we looked at the second ago, the fresco inside of the dome is a great example of a guild or group-based patronage system, right? So you have to also understand that this is just has to do with different dynamics, right? Because like patrons are going to be either hyper-involved in their art and sometimes they weren't involved at all. Patrons varied in level of involvement, right? So, for example, Lorenzo Medici, when he asked Michelangelo, or when he bought the David from Michelangelo, Michelangelo had planned on making it and putting it someplace else. But Lorenzo saw how fine of a piece of art it was, and it's like, you know what? I know you're done with it, but I want to buy it. And they bought it, and they put it right out front of their house, right? So, whereas on the flip side, Julius II was a constant bother to Michelangelo and cr had criticisms and changes and wanted to know what was going on with the Sistine Chapel. So patrons kind of varied in their level of involvement, right? And I only bring this up because we're talking about family and group patronage, right? When the cloth merchants were seeing the dome of the, uh, like, the, like the Duomo, also known as the Santa Maria del Fiore uh, Cathedral in Florence, the cloth merchants were kind of meddling patrons, but it was mainly about due dates and deadlines, right? Whereas Julius was literally in the Sistine Chapel regularly bothering Michelangelo while he was trying to paint this thing, right? So, but, and also you have to understand is this all coincides with the fact that rich people are just going to start spending their money in different ways, right? And a lot of it, what I'm talking about is like, this is how people spent their money in like the Middle Ages, right? Middle Age uh, nobles and royals were typically bit or spend their money on you know, smithed armor or weaponry or full suits of armor or things that craftsmen would make, right? Usually to bestow upon themselves in battle or while riding or something like that. This is going to heavily change because in the Renaissance, people are going to start spending that money differently to try and show prestige of their family by having a famous artwork by a famous artist inside their house, right? For example, the Mona Lisa, of course, paid for by, what's his name? Uh, I think it's Leonardo Gear. I can never remember his name. It's not Ghirlandaio. It's a... Uh, but anyway, so we know that actually this is the wife, the Mona Lisa, is the wife of a wool merchant from uh, Florence, right? And then we also know that we looked at this bad boy before. That right there, that is by Cellini, right? That is by Cellini, and this is Cellini's Perseus standing on the head of, or standing on Medusa. Prayer. Hold on. All right, let's keep getting after it. So this piece right here, like we were just talking about how the Mona Lisa was originally paid for by a guy to have his 
like pregnant wife or possibly soon to be wife that had to be painted, her portrait be painted by Leonardo da Vinci. This right here, of course, was a sculpture that it was made for the Medici Sculpture Garden. This is Perseus standing over the body of Medusa by Cellini, right? Cellini spelled C-E-L-L-I-N-I. -I. And then this is another really famous piece by Cellini. That right there is called the Cellini Salt Cellar. This is a very interesting premise as well. You have to understand that patroned art is not necessarily always just visual arts, okay? When we look at, for example, the Mona Lisa, which is a portrait, or when we look at this piece right here, which was meant to go into a sculpture garden, much like the Statue of David was as well, or when we talk about the Sistine Chapel ceiling but by Michelangelo completed in 1510, those are major pieces of public forms of art. This bad boy was paid for by Francis I of France, one of their earliest kings, and it's a salt cellar. Like, it's just, it holds salt on this table. And it's made out of rolled enamel and gold, all right? It is made by the same guy who designed that bronze sculpture that sits in Florence, right? This bad boy is now in Austria, right? And it was made for a rich guy's table because housewares was even a big thing. Tapestries that would hang in your dining room. Plates uh, embroidered and specially made crafts that would go on your kitchen table were like even on the books for patroned art during the Renaissance, right? So it's not limited just to visual arts. And the interesting part about it is how much do you think this salt cellar is insured for? Oh, I don't know. $60 million. So it's absolutely crazy how like don't limit yourself in the perception that in the Renaissance period, Art was only simply large-scale visual art because it could even be housewares. It could be something small, right? So continuing forward, though, we did see, like, art change heavily, right? We are going to see art go from crusty to awesome, all right? So we're going to see it go from meh to something really, really great, okay? So in the high Middle Ages, right, you saw art look like this. All right, so like that right there is from 1066. It is a section of this thing called the Bayou Tapestry. And th that right there is the only historical account of the Norman conquest of England under William the Conqueror, or aka William of Normandy, when he defeated a man named Harold Godwinson in battle, right, for the English throne. Now, the biggest thing about this crusty, awful art is this is meant to be a historical relic of one of the largest battles that England had ever seen. It is completely two-dimensional. It's cross-stitching. Everything is out of proportion. These dogs are just floating in the middle of the air for some reason. So you're seeing a lack of solidly based visual art, which we would consider quality during this time period. But then it moved into the Byzantine period, right? And the Byzantine, of course, as we know, was an extension of Rome. Did they have quality art? Uh, yes, to a degree, right? They had much better art. One very, very heavily used Byzantinian style was, of course, the style of mosaic, right? Mosaic art was a very popular image in Byzantinian art, right? But what we're going to do is we're actually going to stop right there so you all can prep for your art presentations, and then we're going to actually move into how art exploded, right? And we're going to look at some of the earliest examples of Renaissance art, and we're going to talk about some of this new artwork that you all have been studying this whole time, but you guys have been killing it, absolutely crushing it. I will see you guys soon. Y'all have a good one.